retirement. A Senate committee hears from financial analysts on how Americans can strengthen their 401k accounts and the problem of workers putting their retirement at risk by borrowing against their savings. This hearing of the Senate Special Committee on Aging runs about an hour and 20 minutes. Good morning to one and all, and we thank you all for being here today. This morning we're going to talk about saving smartly for retirement. Less than 30 years ago, Congress created a new type of savings plan, the 401k, to help ensure Americans to have adequate income retirement. However, increasingly we are seeing 401k funds being treated as rainy day funds as participants take out withdrawals and loans. Today we will learn more about the financial repercussions of this practice and examine policies that can best promote the original purpose of 401ks, namely the retention and the growth of retirement savings. First, let's look at the numbers. According to the Employee Benefit Research Institute, nearly one in five 401k plan participants do have an outstanding loan. We will learn from Dr. Weller's testimony that loans and withdrawals are not only increasing in number, but that loan amounts are growing substantially as well. We can only expect that these trends will worsen as more people face economic hardships due to the housing and credit crises, and over the long term contribute to America's already poor record on savings. We need to be clear that we are not saying that all 401k loans and withdrawals are a bad thing. Research has shown that making loans and withdrawals available for legitimate purposes can help encourage people to participate in 401k plans. However, loans and withdrawals can be ill-advised for several reasons, and we believe that participants should be aware of the negative consequences they may have on their retirement savings. Frankly, I believe that there are some ways of using 401k savings that are patently bad such as a 401k debit card. By offering a 401k debit card, plans send the message that it is okay to use retirement savings for everyday purchases, despite the fact that the high fees associated with its use will drastically diminish savings. When a participant can use his or her 401k plan to make casual everyday purchases, like buying, even buying a cup of coffee, Clearly, that is a gross distortion of the plan's intended use. We're also concerned about the high fees many plans charge their participants. These fees can significantly reduce the amount of savings Americans have when they retire. Last fall, I held a hearing to consider the impact of these 401k fees and promote their disclosure. Following the hearing, I introduced a bill with Senator Harkin that would require all 401k plan managers to, re to reveal to both employers and workers how much they charge in administrative fees. Considering the impact fees can have on savings over time, I'm concerned about recent advertising campaigns that encourage federal employees and retirees to move their retirement accounts out of the federal thrift savings program and into higher fee accounts. The TSP has the lowest administrative costs of any retirement program in the country, and I believe that these misleading ads are a disservice to hardworking public servants. Therefore, yesterday I sent letters to the companies that we know are running these advertisements, asking them to re-examine this practice. Just a moment, in just a moment, we will hear from several experts and industry officials about how loans and withdrawals can be used more responsibly. We will also hear from the manager of the largest retirement savings plan, the TSP, about their policy on loans and withdrawals. Following today's hearing, I plan to introduce a bill with Senator Schumer that will prohibit the use of 401k debit cards and to set a limit on the number of loans a participant can take. 
In closing, the bottom line of today's hearing is that 401k and similar defined contribution plans were created to ensure that people would have adequate savings for retirement, not as a source of credit to use casually. The federal government provides $325 billion in tax benefits over the next five years to encourage retirement savings each year. I believe we have a duty to make sure that they are used properly so that all Americans can have a secure retirement. We turn now to Ranking Manager, uh, Member uh, Senator Gordon Smith for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you, thank you for being here today. And to our witnesses, we appreciate the contribution you're making by uh, your testimony uh, here before this committee. These are tough times for American families. Gas and food prices, prices are at record highs, and this makes it difficult for many families to fill up their cars and pay for essential groceries. The current economic environment also makes it difficult for many families to pay their bills on time or at all. Many people are faced with missing one or two payments that they have every intention of making up the next month. But the next thing you know, they're in a hole trying to dig their way out of debt and just don't have the cash to do it. Given how common this scenario has become, I'm not surprised that many Americans are looking to their retirement savings to help them make ends meet. Fidelity has seen an increase of 16 percent in 401k hardship withdrawals in comparing the first quarter of 2007 to 2008. And according to a survey released in February by the Trans America Center for Retirement Studies, at the end, last, end of last year, 18 percent of workers had loans outstanding from their plans, up to from 11 percent in 2006. Although I understand the reason, this trend concerns me and us, as tapping into 401k savings today can have a significant impact on one's level of income at retirement age. According to Vanguard, an employee who takes out two loans totaling $30,000 from their 401k and pays them back in five years will have almost $40,000 less in their 401k after 40 years than an employee who takes no loans. Considering the medium 401k account balance in 2006 was about $66,000, $40,000 is a lot of money. This leads me to uh, my final point, one I've made many times before. Americans need to save more for retirement. For most of us, our 401ks will be our primary source of retirement savings. And, and $66,000 is certainly not enough money to retire on, especially if you take out another $40,000. I've been working over the past few years on ways to help Americans increase their retirement savings. I'm pleased that Mark uh, Avery and Dave John, uh, David John uh, from the Retirement Security Project are with us today to share their perspective and ideas on this topic. Mark and David came up with the concept of the automatic IRA, which Senator Bingham and I then developed into legislation. Our auto IRA bill would allow those employees not covered by a qualified retirement plan to save for retirement through automatic payroll deposit IRAs. The auto IRA bill is currently under consideration by the Senate, and I hope my colleagues will join me in pushing for its much needed passage. Again, I thank you all for being here and look forward to uh, this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Smith. At this time, we're pleased to welcome our panel. Our first witness will be Dr. Christian Weller. Dr. Weller is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and an associate professor of public policy at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's an expert on retirement income security, and his work has been featured in numerous academic and popular publications. Next, we'll be hearing from two witnesses who will share the joint time, Mark Avery and David John. They are both principals with the Retirement Security Project. Mr. Avery is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Previously, Mr. Avery served as the Benefit Tax Counsel at the U.S. Treasury Department between 1995 and 2001, where he was responsible for tax and regulations relating to tax-qualified pension and 401k plans. Mr. John is a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where he has written and lectured extensively on the importance of reforming 
our nation's retirement system. Next, we'll be hearing from Gregory Long. Mr. Long is Executive Director of the Federal Retirement Thrift Investigation Board, Investment Board, and he serves as the Managing Fiduciary of the Thrift Savings Plan, or TSP. The TSP is the largest defined contribution plan in the world, serving over 3.7 million current and former federal employees and uniform service members with over $200 billion in assets. Previously, Mr. Long worked for City Street and Putnam Investments. Our next witness will be John Gannon. Mr. Gannon is the Senior Vice President for Investor Education at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA. Previously, he served as a Deputy Director of the Office of Investor Education and Assistance at the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission. And finally, we'll be hearing from Bruce Bent. Mr. Bent is the founder and chairman of the Reserve and its sister company, Reserve Solutions. The Reserve manages over $120 billion in assets, making it the third largest family-owned asset manager in the United States. We welcome you all. We look forward to hearing from you, and we'd appreciate it if you would hold your testimony to five minutes. Mr. Weller. Thank you very much, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Smith, for inviting me here today to talk about 401k loans and trends on those loans and the causes of those loans. I will make the point that demand for 401k loans is largely driven by economic necessities. The economic necessities are unemployment, bad health, and home ownership, especially during the housing boom. Now, as the housing crisis grips the country, more and more individuals are tapping their 401ks to help over, smooth over the troubled economic times. But this means that families leverage their future retirement security to ease their present financial insecurity. To counter this trend, policymakers must reduce the need for people to borrow. This will require substantial improvements to income growth for America families and a commitment to providing health and unemployment insurance to citizens who experience unexpected health expenditures and job loss. Let me give a little bit of background on 401k loans. When families encounter rising demands on their budgets, such as medical emergency, a spell of unemployment, or higher costs for necessary items, including housing, they often turn to consumer loans to help them smooth over a rough patch. Workers who are covered by a 401k can, be able, can borrow from their own savings. An account holder may borrow up to half of his or her retirement savings with no penalty as long as the loan is repaid within five years. The interest rate is low, typically 1 to 2 percent above the prime interest rate, but there are clear drawbacks. Once the money is out of the retirement account, it doesn't earn a rate of return. The low interest rate also means that you get low additions to retirement savings, and if you don't pay the loan, there are substantial penalties. The impact of the 401k loans has been, can be severe. And we calculated on a paper that we're releasing today with the Center for American Progress some hypothetical examples. We find that if you take out $5,000 in loans as a typical worker in the first five years of having such a loan, you can reduce your retirement savings by the end of your career by up to 22 percent, depending on the various assumptions. That is a substantial reduction in retirement savings. This reduction in retirement savings comes typically at a time when other retirement income is also going down. And this is the case right now. Housing values have fallen at the fastest rate in more than three decades, and financial markets have been in turmoil for a year now, decimating existing retirement savings. At the same time, families are increasing their borrowing from 401k loans due to the growing economic hardships. We also find that 401k loans generally add to the total debt burden that families have. They do not substitute for other loans. 401k loans grew in total amount to $31 billion in 2004, the last year for which we have data, up from $6 billion in 1989, an increase of almost 400 percent. This reflects just simply the fact that more people have loans, have the access to those loans, but it also means that borrowers are tapping out on other loans. What we find in particular is that 401k loan holders have typically a median debt payments relative to income of 22.5 percent of their income, substantially higher for those who do not have those loans, 18 percent. This wouldn't be the case if 401k loans substituted for other forms of debt. The reason why people take out there, there have been a number of important shifts in terms of demographic characteristics of who is taking out the loans. The differences between minorities and whites have been shrinking, meaning whites have been taking out loans faster than minorities over time. Um, the 401k loan holders also have gotten younger, and they have also become more educated over time. So this is becoming increasingly a middle-class phenomenon, if you will. 
The reason why people borrow is because they have to. The primary reason why what we find is it's bad health. A spell of bad health increases having a loan by more than 50 percent. When homeowners, also home ownership, especially during the housing boom, has forced people to borrow more from their 401k loans. However, that comes at a cost. We find that homeowners who have a 401k loans typically have higher mortgage payments, less equity, and are more likely to have an adjustable mortgage. That means basically homeowners who are financially tapped out otherwise are now borrowing from a 401k loans to basically just afford the, 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 uh, the down payment in the housing boom period. So the solution here for us at least is that, that we need to find ways to keep people from borrowing, from tapping into retirement income security. That means we need to strengthen income growth, but we also need to create a stronger social safety net so that people do not have to use their 401k plans as supplemental unemployment insurance or health insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Weller. Mr. Avery, Mr. John. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Smith, I'm Mark Avery with the Brookings Institution. This is my colleague David John with the Heritage Foundation. We're both principals uh, of the Nonpartisan Retirement Security Project. And we're pleased to appear together essentially as a single witness before you today to emphasize the importance in this area in particular of an approach that transcends traditional partisan and ideological divisions. We would like to present our views jointly on savings, including the automatic IRA proposal that uh, you, Senator Smith, and uh, Senator Bingaman have introduced as the lead co-sponsors, and on the leakage issue that's the main topic of this hearing. Senator Smith, you've already described the problem of inadequate saving, uh, as have you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we recognize that adequate retirement security and adequate saving require not only increasing saving, which David John will, will discuss in connection with the automatic IRA, but preserving savings that have already been done so that they do not leak out of the pension system by being consumed prematurely. Often the discussion of pension leakage focuses on loans and hardship withdrawals. But in a system that's increasingly dominated by 401k plans that are funded by voluntary employee contributions, many people may be reluctant to contribute unless they know they can have at least limited access to their savings if they have a critical need. And the employer that's sponsoring the 401k traditionally has had an interest in encouraging those voluntary contributions and therefore an interest in allowing loans and hardships as a kind of liquidity carrot for people to participate in the plan because broad participation enables the employer to pass the non-discrimination standards and enables the top people to contribute more to the plan. Things are changing. 401ks are coming of age. Sponsors are no longer uniformly interested in getting rid of accounts for terminated employees and automatic enrollment, that is putting people in the plan automatically unless they opt out, is transforming the 401k landscape in a way that is very potentially relevant to this leakage issue. This may mean that plan sponsors, because they have higher participation through automatic enrollment, will be less concerned about using access to savings as an inducement to broader participation and can sponsor K plans that limit leakage that use automatic or behavioral strategies to reduce the occasions when people take lump sums from the plan, in particular after they leave employment. Accordingly, at least as a first step, it may be worth exploring whether sponsors are willing to engage in a best practice of allowing lump sums on termination of employment only if they're directly rolled over to another employer plan or IRA or the departing employee has reached a specified age, such as 55 or 65, unless the employee can demonstrate a hardship and a need for the immediate access to the fund, such as extended unemployment. This would fall between the defined benefit approach to post-employment leakage and the current 401k practice. We'd be happy to discuss our specific proposals, including the need for a leakage policy after retirement that is more annuities and lifetime income in 401k plans uh, during your question and answers. David? The other source of leakage 
area. The other source of leakage that could, should concern both this committee and the nation as a whole is the money that never got put in the plan in the first place. And this comes basically from two sources. One is the fact that roughly 78 million workers are employed in the U.S. by a company that doesn't offer any form of retirement savings plan or all, at all. And other workers will have employment with these companies maybe as an interlude between jobs with companies that do offer this sort of uh, retirement savings plan. In response, as Senator Smith has mentioned, Mark and I developed the automatic IRA. The automatic IRA would probably affect roughly 40 million out of these 78 million workers. It's designed as a simple, low-cost, low-burden option for the employer and a simple, low-cost savings option for the worker. It's crafted to discourage employers from moving from a 401k plan down to an auto IRA. As a matter of fact, it's actually crafted exactly the opposite, to encourage people to start with an auto IRA and move up to a simple or a 401k. I'll close by citing a study by Prudential Insurance Company. They looked, found that 8 in 10 employees uh, were very interested in the auto IRA. And they said, quote, in fact, the more employees learned about the auto IRA, the more they were interested in it. Now, this same study also surveyed about 200 smaller employers, the ones who would offer this, and they found that 8 in 10 businesses believe that the design overcomes their concern and support the adoption of the auto IRA. Again, the more they heard about it, the more they liked it. Further, they discovered that roughly 54% of eligible employees would be creating new savings rather than moving savings around. We think that leakage is a very serious problem, and we appreciate the fact that you're addressing that in this hearing. But at the same time, we need to look at both sources of leakage, both out of existing plans and, as I say, the money that never got there in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We'd like to hear from Mr. Long at this point. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, my name is Greg Long. I am the Executive Director of the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board and, as such, the Managing Fiduciary of the Thrift Savings Plan for Federal Employees. I welcome the opportunity to appear before your committee to discuss the TSP loan and the in-service withdrawal programs. I commend the committee's efforts to focus public attention on protecting and strengthening retirement savings programs especially with regard to those participants who might engage in unnecessary borrowing or indiscriminate early withdrawals. The Board's own experience over the past 20 years shows that a close attention and a willingness to adjust in these areas is critical to ensure a good balance between uh, the goals of achieving participants' long-term retirement goals and meeting their short-term needs. In 1988, TSP participants who contributed their own funds were first permitted to borrow for four specific purposes. Medical, medical expenses, education, financial hardship, or to purchase a primary residence. Documentation to demonstrate the loan's purpose was required. Participants could have a maximum of two loans outstanding. Like 401k plans, TSP loans were subject to restrictions found in the Internal Revenue Code and in regulations issued by the IRS. As with similar loan programs in 401k plans, our loan is intended to encourage employees to voluntarily contribute their own funds by allowing limited access to those funds when necessary. After eight years of administrative experience, the board identified three areas that required improvement. First, the four purposes were viewed by some as overly restricted. Second, the documentation process, which for a worldwide plan like the TSP was of necessity conducted over long distances by mail, was administratively difficult. Finally, some participants with financial difficulties were already overwhelmed by debt. They required debt relief in order to get their heads above water. The board worked with the Congress and Senator Ted Stevens in particular, who was widely regarded as the father of the TSP, to resolve these issues in legislation. As a result, the Thrift Savings Plan Act of 1996, the board was permitted to offer general purpose loans requiring no documentation. Additionally, in-service withdrawals for financial hardship and for those who attained age 59 and a half were allowed for the first time. As expected, loan activity increased. Between 1997 and 2003, the number of participants with loans increased from 219,000 to 554,000. Although we cannot demonstrate any direct connection, the FERS participation rate increased from 82.9 to 86.9 percent during the same period. The TSP loan program was again modified in 2004. The need for this change was identified a year earlier when the board implemented the new daily value record keeping system. 
a relatively small number of participants were found to be uh, borrowing slightly larger amounts over and over again in an apparent attempt to supplement their basic pay. A review of this practice found that one participant had used the program to borrow 31 times. As the board was implementing a new record keeping system in 2003, this serial borrowing caused significant administrative problems. In July of 2004, after careful study and a review of private sector practices, the board implemented three changes, a $50 loan fee, a 60-day waiting period between loans, and a limit of just one general purpose and one primary residential loan at any time. We view these changes, which we continue to employ today, as highly effective. A total of 353,000 new TSP loans were dispersed during 2003. Uh, in 2005, that number dropped to 192,000. The overall number of loans, which was rapidly approaching 1 million, ha has uh, steadily declined. Meanwhile, the total average monthly contribution per participant has continued to steadily increase, from $432 per month in 2005 to $497 uh, per month in 2008. Unlike the changes that characterize the 20-year history of the TSP loan program, the in-service withdrawal program, which first became available in 1997, has had only one major change. Originally, like loans, hardship requ uh, required documentation. As with loans, the board found this requirement to be administratively burdensome. Therefore, with the introduction of the new record-keeping system, participants were permitted to self-certify their hardship conditions. However, I would like to point out that in addition to the tax consequences, participants are also restricted from making employee contributions and therefore from receiving matching contributions for six months after uh, taking a financial hardship withdrawal. Therefore, there are deterrents built into the program. Uh, finally, I, I, uh, I've also provided the committee with copies of our 2008 edition of Highlights, which is our newsletter. The feature article of this newsletter, which is published on our website, is being sent to participants. The key article is called Look Before You Leap. I would like to explain why I found it necessary to issue such a caution to participants. Earlier this year, I stepped out of the board's office in downtown Washington, and I saw a bus stop billboard that urged federal employees to transfer their old TSP account, uh, accounts, I put that in quotes, uh, to the advertising sponsor's IRA. Shortly thereafter, a second advertising campaign, which is similarly targeted, told readers that their TSP accounts would retire. I'm here today to advise that after 21 years, the TSP is still young and vigorous, it isn't getting old, and it does not intend to retire. Thanks to the wisdom of Senator Stevens and other congressional authors, it will continue to follow the timeless principle of tracking broad market performance while adding value for participants via very low administrative expenses. Our, and our participants recognize the value of the TSP. Last year, over 20,000 checks came in uh, for a total of $478 million rolled into the TSP from private sector 401k and IRA accounts. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. Now we'll hear from Mr. Gannon. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm John Gannon, Senior Vice President for Investor Education at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. As the largest non-governmental regulator for the country's securities firms, FINRA's top priority is to ensure fair markets for American investors. On behalf of FINRA, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on such an important topic. You have my written testimony, so this morning I'd like to highlight what we at FINRA view as emerging threats to a secure retirement. For today's investors, especially those close to retirement, the number of hurdles on the road to financial security is growing every day. The cost of living is up, home prices are down, and credit has dried up. Financial institutions that once seemed invincible have failed or are in trouble. The Washington Post reports that nearly three out of five middle class retirees will likely run out of money if they don't change their spending habits. Supporting that is a recent AARP study citing the personal bankruptcy filings for middle-aged Americans has risen by mo more than 50 percent since the 1990s. When people feel pinched for cash, they often choose risky ways to make ends meet. In fact, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, and Vanguard have reported significant increases in 401k hardship with withdrawals since last year. A recent Wall Street Journal Harris Interactive survey found that about one quarter of adults actively planning for retirement 
have prematurely withdrawn money from the retirement investments. Also feeding into this anxiety are unscrupulous financial professionals, many of them unregistered. They push investments that promise security, but too often they end in financial ruin. At FINRA, we believe that the first line of defense for every investor is education. That's why we are focused on teaching investors about the importance of retirement savings and the consequences of early withdrawals from 401ks. FINRA is focused in two ways to help protect investors and teach them in these uncertain times. First, we use surveillance and enforcement tools to detect and deter abusive sales practices. Second, we do everything we can to educate investors to help them make the best financial decisions. I'd like to highlight two areas of concern today, early retirement scams and 401k debit cards. As you know, Section 72T of the IRS Code permits penalty-free early withdrawals from company-sponsored plans before the age of 59 and a half. Some financial advisors tout 72T as a loophole that allows investors to retire early by withdrawing assets and reinvesting them. Investors are often promised unrealistically high returns, but are rarely told about the downside of those investments. One case in particular comes to mind. A few years ago, a 57-year-old retiree from Belton, Missouri was promised that his 72T investment would earn 9%. He was persuaded to invest $1 million in retirement savings into two variable annuities. Seven months later, $225,000 of his principal was gone. But that was just the beginning. Eventually, he lost over $450,000 due to the negligence and fraud on the part of this, his broker. More recently, FINRA sanctioned two securities firms, Citigroup and Securities America, for misleading investors in this way. They were fined $5.5 million and ordered to pay $26 million in restitution to hundreds of former Bell South and ExxonMobil employees. In both cases, the firms were on-site targeting employees at their workplaces. Given the aging U.S. demographic, we are likely to see even more investors victimized in this way. FINRA will continue to take action where investors are treated improperly. An other potential threat to a secure retirement is the relatively new 401k debit card. In May, FINRA published an investor alert outlining the dangers of 401k debit cards, and we hope investors heed our warnings. Investors can use a debit card to borrow directly from their 401k account for any purpose, but as they spend it, they may wipe out a good portion of their retirement savings. Taking money out of your retirement savings, even for a short period of time, can be disastrous. FINRA has developed a number of tools that focus on building and protecting retirement savings. First, we have our 401k Learning Center on our website, FINRA.org. Here we explain everything from 401k enrollment to the risks of cashing out before retirement. FINRA has also teamed up with the Retirement Securities Project and ARP to establish Retirement Made Simpler an effort to use automatic features such as automatic enrollment to increase participation in 401k plans. We issue investor alerts warning about early retirement pitches and products that could be harmful, and we offer online tools to help employers check out early retirement salespeople and avoid potential scams. Mr. Chairman, FINRA appreciates the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with the committee, the SEC, and other regulators to expand Americans' financial knowledge and to help them build a secure retirement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gannon. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Mr. Ben. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Smith. Sorry. Cha Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bruce Bent. I am the Chairman of the Reserve, the leading cash management specialist for institutional and individual investors. I am also Chairman of Reserve Solutions, a sister company. Reserve companies currently manage over $125 billion. Reserve is best known as the creator of the Money Market Mutual Fund. We wanted a product that would provide a return that reflects actual money market interest rates while providing safety of principle liquidity and a high degree of safety. As we all know now, the money market fund has been extremely successful with nearly $4 trillion invested in it. 
I say that for purposes of identification. I'm here today to discuss Reserve Plus, the Qualified Pension Plan Administrative Services that we provide. Reserve Plus was created to help address the challenges of increasing participation by lower income and younger workers who traditionally don't participate because they feel they cannot afford to lose access to their earnings. To begin, Reserve Plus does not approve loan requests, establish or interpret loan policies, and is not a plan fiduciary. We are simply a software processor. Our service is made available only to participants who have been directed to us by plan administrators in accordance with their employer's policy. Once a participant's request has been approved, they direct the plan administrator to transfer their money into a loan account within their plan. The amount in that account is then invested in a reserve money market mutual fund. Participants may then access the amount of their account using checks or a debit card. Each Reserve Plus participant is provided with materials cont containing a description of the service, its operation, and associated charges. The committee has been provided with copies of these disclosures. The account opening fee averages $75 and the subsequent annual maintenance fee ranges from $25 to $50. Charges that typically apply to both conventional loan programs and Reserve Plus and are paid to the plan administrators, not reserved. As is usual with plastic-based transactions, there is a $2 fee for cash advances, but no fee for purchase by check or card. In addition, the plan participants pay themselves an interest rate of the prime rate and a service fee to Reserve Plus, which ranges from 2.9 to 3.25 percent on loan balances actually utilized. The average loan balance for participants in plans utilizing Reserve Plus is approximately 35 percent less than the average loan balance for all participant plans, specifically 48,000 versus 4,800, excuse me, versus 7,200. Our default rate is 2.2 percent, and we have been unable to determine what the industry average default rate is. Reserve Plus is different from traditional loan programs because participants may establish an account without actually withdrawing funds. A traditional loan actually forces money out of a plan by requiring a participant to withdraw the entire amount approved immediately in a lump sum. With Reserve Plus, the participant funds remains within the plan, continuing to earn sheltered investment returns until a participant withdraws them. The participant may withdraw as little or as much as needed at any time up to the amount approved by the employer. There is no lump sum withdrawal requirement. When participants know they have access to the money, they contribute more into the plan and take less out of the plan. At the end of the day, participants accumulate greater overall retirement savings using Reserve Plus services over conventional loan processing. Participants with Reserve Plus services are also less likely to default on their loan plans when they leave the job. Industry practice for traditional loans requires them to be repaid through payroll reductions. As a result, employees that are terminated, resign, or retire are no longer able to continue repaying their loans via payroll uh, deductions. In these circumstances, plans utilizing traditional loan processing typically give a participant only 90 days or less to repay all outstanding loans. A participant who is unable to repay the outstanding balance will incur a taxable distribution subject to regular city, state, and federal income taxes an additional 10 percent penalty if they're under the age of 59 and a half. Obviously, the participants' retirement savings will also be reduced by the amount of the default. This instant repayment requirement in traditional plans is a significant deterrent to employees joining a plan because it becomes at a time that the participants are least able to afford it. This is not so with Reserve Plus. Under traditional loan plans, Reserve Plus is, unlike additional loan pl programs, Reserve Plus is not dependent on payroll deduction and allows participants to continue making their regular payments even after they leave their employer. Given the increasingly mobile workforce, this feature of Reserve Plus helps safeguard participants' retirement savings. Reserve Plus also allows participants to prepay in advance in whole or in part at any time and to reduce the amount available in their loan account at any time, unlike traditional loan processing through payroll. We design Reserve Plus with several concrete advantages to plan participants over traditional loans. I share your concerns for American seniors and for hardworking Americans like my parents, a postal employee, and a school cafeteria worker. <clears throat> 
I am very proud of the innovations Reserve Plus offers to participants in overcoming many shortcomings of the prevailing practices that encourage workers, regardless of income level, to participate in retire plans at the maximum level as soon as they are eligible. Thank you for your time. Again, happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bent. Turn now to my colleague, the ranking member, Senator Smith, for his uh, questions, and then we'll turn to Senator Salazar and Senator McCaskill. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, all of you, your testimony has been excellent. Um, I wonder, uh, Mark and, and David, as you've gone out with your, I think, very bipartisan proposal on automatic RAs, uh, I think you both commented that the more people know, the more uh, they warm up to it. Uh, I, I assume that is, I heard you correctly. You did, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously we're here because we have a real dilemma. We, we have a national savings problem. We have a demographic bubble with the baby boom generation getting ready to retire and insufficient preparation for retirement. And we're looking for what we can best do to facilitate um, the retirement of, of uh, elder Americans. I'm wondering, in, in your opinion, any of you, wh which is worse? Um, uh, plan loans or, or hardship withdrawals? What, what is the most destructive uh, thing that could be done to one's 401k plan? Uh, uh, Senator Smith, the loan at least is repaid. Uh, the withdrawal is uh, not generally repaid. Uh, and worse than either of those, if I may, is actually the lump sum that is distributed or offered to a participant each time they change jobs leaving a 401k plan. We probably have more leakage coming from lump sums paid out, <coughs> excuse me, paid out between jobs than we do from the more restrictive loan and hardship withdrawal regimes that apply while the person is employed. So that's the area that I think we need to question as the highest priority. Do we really want to be offering the money to a participant every time he or she changes from one 401k sponsor to another rather than having a portable, seamless saving system. Well, I mean, clearly we, you know, plan uh, loans and hardship with withdrawals are designed to provide liquidity as an inducement for people to enroll in the first place. I think you've all made that clear. But if you go to an automatic enrollment system, do we need those kinds of inducements? Uh, where do we draw this line? That's really what I'm getting at. Uh, I, I think it's a great question. It's a balancing. The employer is trying to induce participation by offering enough liquidity so people feel they can get that money if they really desperately need it. But we should leave that door open only a crack. Uh, and a, an automatic enrollment plan gets that kind of participation probably with less need for liquidity as an inducement. Therefore, the employer should feel freer, and we would hope that policymakers would feel freer, to uh, narrow that opening to reduce the uh, access because we don't need it as much in the modern auto-enrolled 401k universe. So I think your policies of restricting leakage, as I understand them, we're looking carefully at whether we can restrict leakage some more, are timely. Several of you have commented that uh, the more people know, the more comfortable they are. Are we at the federal government level, Department of Labor, Department of Treasury, doing enough to educate people so that they understand and feel to, to get involved? Um, Senator, uh, there's always more that can be done with educating investors about 401ks and other retirement savings vehicles. I mean, we are constantly trying to strive to get the information that's out there into as many hands as we can. I mean, that's why we work through the FINRA Financial Investor Education Foundation um, to give grants to organizations such as libraries so that the information can get into every community. Um, there needs to be much more done with that. Also, information has to be available at the time that people need it. So that means when they are going to get a loan from their 401k, is the education available at that point? Is it available when they're taking a hardship withdrawal? Is it available when they are making financial decisions with, re with respect to their financial savings? Last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, 
it, it seems that it, in Congress we, we like to uh, speak and act as though the cycles of supply and demand don't exist and we can repeal them, that market corrections and cycles in our economy uh, we can somehow control. We've never been able to do that, but uh, that's, that certainly has um, uh, been the history in Congress. Um, as much as we would like the times always to be good, we've had bad times in the past. Uh, since the introduction of the 401k, uh, is this cycle, this down cycle different in terms of the leakage that you're seeing? So far, the data is not out. We won't know until, firmly know until next year when we get the new data from the uh, financial, for the reserve. Um, it doesn't look all that different from what we've seen from the recent surveys. It doesn't look all that different. We expect the numbers to increase, the loan amounts, the number of people who have those loans, but those are clearly tied to both the availability of health insurance and the availability of unemployment insurance and other savings. And in that regard, the current downturn is different because people now have much more debt than they used to. I mean, right now, for the first quarter of 2008, we had a record amount of 132 percent of disposable income. That's the highest number we've ever seen. Personal debt to income has risen four times faster than it did during the 1990s. So now there is less fallback position for families. So that makes it different. But generally, I think the, the factors that drive people into a loan are not that different from previous loans. It, again, it's the lack of um, savings to smooth you over a rough patch, either health insurance or, um, or unemployment insurance. Senator, uh, obviously we, we, we hope this too, we trust this too will pass, but in the meanwhile, we should be doing everything we yeah. can to help people keep their savings for the long term when, when better times are here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be uh, pleased to be added as a co-sponsor of your bill. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Before I turn it over to Senator Salazar, I just want to ask, make one um, statement, ask a, a single question for all of you. Uh, companies like Karsten Manufacturing, which is the maker of the Ping Golf products, which we're all familiar with, they do not allow any loans on their plan and still they boast a 92 percent participation rate uh, in significantly because they have very generous matching fund provision in terms of company contributions. So if we have generous matching fund and if we have automatic enrollment and we don't allow uh, people to opt out, um, in many ways is that the most desirable kind of a plan that we'd like to see? There's a number. I'm not perfect. What do you think, Mr. Weller? There's a number of ways of obviously increasing both participation and contributions. Matches are a big part in terms of at least increasing contributions. They don't do that much in terms of participation, but automatic enrollment uh, is certainly one way of going. I also want to add in something the liquidity per option that was discussed here. Yes, the evidence from the past shows that if you have the loan option, hardship withdrawal option, it does increase contributions, but over time the evidence seems to suggest that that effect has diminished, at least according to our research. So I think that other factors such as automatic enrollment and uh, employer matches are a much better way of increasing participation and the wealth, and ultimately that goes into line with what Mark said uh, in terms of restricting the access to loans. For us, the short answer is yes, and when it comes right down to it, education is a key, but plan design, we have found, actually is much more of a determinant as to success, and I think this is one case where that shows that. I have Mr. Viewed, Long and then Mr. Ben. Uh, I, I have viewed loans as a necessary evil, uh, necessary to encourage participation. Uh, as automatic enrollment becomes more popular and at some point used within the TSP, and as matching becomes more lucrative, the, the, the necessity of loans starts to decrease. Mr. Bent. What I encountered just several weeks ago, that a person actually resigned from their job because they had no access to their 401k. So unintended consequences, so maybe a little bit more flexibility would be helpful. Mr. Gannon. Well, to give you an example, I, I mean, I, obviously we believe strongly in auto enrollment, auto escalation, because we work with the Retirement Secur Securities Project to promote those efforts with medium-sized employees. To give you an example, at FINRA, we established auto enrollment in 1997. Our participation rate went from 75 percent to over 97 percent. 
Um, and you see that time and time again when employers move to auto enrollment and auto escalation features. And there are, is little downside to using those features. I'm concerned about loans. I'm even more concerned about debit cards because I believe they will lead to current consumption. You shouldn't be using your 401k to buy pizzas and lattes. And that's the only reason I think you would use a plastic card. Thank you, Mr. Gannon. Senator Salazar. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member Smith, for holding this important hearing, um, saving smartly for retirement. Uh, it's a very important subject and something that I'm glad uh, Senator Cole has decided to put a focus on. What I'd like you to comment on um, for me is um, the current economic circumstance and uh, what you might paint out to be uh, what could be a parade of horribles happening uh, with, with uh, people's uh, retirement accounts and uh, 401ks. We all know the statistics related to what's happening with fuel and $4 a gallon gas. We know the hardship that people are facing with respect to home ownership, given, given the housing crisis that we're seeing across America. We know what's happening with the huge escalating costs in higher education. And we know uh, what's happening with health care costs for, for Americans. People may disagree whether we're in a recession or not. But I don't, I don't think there's any disagreement that there's, there are a lot of Americans who are facing tremendous hardship. And so when you have that kind of hardship and you're feeling that kind of economic pain, you start looking to those uh, potential assets that you have to help you through these hard times. And so whether it's taking loans from your 401k or maybe uh, taking an early withdrawal from your 401k, uh, what is the parade of horribles here? I mean, if, if, if the economic times continue to be as uh, painful as they um, uh, are, I think, in the last several months, if uh, they continue to exacerbate, uh, what's going to happen to the savings smartly for retirement? Uh, um, well, I, I think when it comes to the current economic situation, it's important to understand that the downturn in the housing market and the stock market has been a bad situation worse. It wasn't like we had this wonderful econo economy before 2007 and everything was going well. On the contrary, the labor market was weak. People had to borrow a lot of money. That made them very vulnerable to the current economic downturn. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing at this point. People already had very few savings. They were highly leveraged, so they're losing their homes. The home equity is dropping. At this point, people own the smallest share of the homes that we have on record, 46 percent of their homes is actually their own. Um, so I, I think the, the parade of horribles at this point means we're going to see more foreclosures. We're going to see more bankruptcies. We have seen in, uh, 80 percent increase in the bankruptcy rate, 90 percent in bankruptcy filing since 2006. So that kind of part, that's the first line of defense. We're going to see ma massive de foreclosures and defaults, and that's going to continue. The second part is we're going to see people struggling with higher costs of living, and that ultimately means less retirement savings. And on top of that, because in a week, we are in a weak economy, employers are cutting back on the benefits that people have traditionally relied on to make ends meet, just as in retirement savings and health insurance. So ultimately what that adds up to is that we see a big drop down in financial security and ultimately in retirement income security. I, again, it, it's a little too early at this point to come up with a complete numbers, but we already saw a big drop in retirement income security from 2001 to 2004, and we expect that could to continue as we get the new data for 2007. Let me, let me ask you this question, and the other panelists may follow up on that. I mean, given that reality, which you described, I think, very well, what then should we in the United States Senate be thinking about doing to deal with uh, some of the uh, consequences of uh, the economic hard times that we're in? Well, I think you need to think about three things is to increase incomes where we can through an improved earned income tax credit and other measures along those lines, <clears throat> promote savings through a saver credit, refundable saver credit preferably, along those lines to have a real wealth building strategy, and ultimately <clears throat> what I call an efficiency policy to shelter families from the effects of rapidly rising prices, for instance, for health care, for our energy and other things. That means broader energy efficiency, more efficiency in the health care system. I think those are the general three directions to go in. Uh, in terms of policy. Mark or David? Uh, Senator, uh, I think we can uh, very much focus on the fact that this will not last forever, this downturn, and it won't be the last downturn that we will see. So I think one of the things that the Senate should do is keep uh, the nation's eye on the long term. 
uh, and focus on the solutions to the uh, potential parade of horribles, ways to prevent it. I think uh, Mr. Weller uh, put it well. We need to make it easier for people to save uh, and to not make it too easy for them to withdraw their money. Expanding the saver's credit, make it, making it uh, refundable is key. The automatic IRA proposal that Senator Smith and Senator Bingaman have been lead co-sponsors on is key. Uh, there's a reason why that's been endorsed by both the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Reagan and for President Clinton, Marty Feldstein, Laura Tyson, respectively, why it's been endorsed by the New York Times on its editorial page and by the Washington Times chief political correspondent uh, and other bipartisan endorsements. And we need to make sure that the parade of horribles does not include easy access to carefully built up uh, retirement savings through a flood of things like debit cards uh, or other devices that make it overly easy for people to undo all the hard work they've done in building up their savings. Okay. So very, I have about 50 seconds here, so anybody um, else want to comment? Y yes, Senator. Um, more than 10,000 Americans are turning 60 every day, and I think that's the difference with the e economic downcline we're seeing now, is that people are needing their money from their retirement savings. If you're 25 and there's an economic downturn, time is on your side to recover from that. But if you need to take withdrawals today or the near future, it's a much more difficult situation for you. Either you're going to have to continue working or you're going to have to live on less income. Um, and we need to address better ways to make sure that people understand how to withdraw money from their retirement savings. There's much investor education that's been done about saving for retirement. There's been little done to teach people about how, what are the best ways to withdraw, how to use annuitization to enhance your ability to keep that money for your entire retirement period. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Cole. Thank you very much, Senator Salazar. Senator McCaskill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I come from a state where one of our most treasured values is common sense, mm. and it defies common sense that giving Americans plastic is a way to increase savings. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me, Mr. Bent. Um, I'd like to ask you about your relationships with the employers in these plans. Um, your, your debit cards um, are around because they're profitable, I assume, for your company. Not yet, but one would hope so, yes. Okay. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, I guess we're working out about seven years now. Seven years? Mm -hmm. And, and y your, your company has not been profitable yet? No, it has not. I assume that the reason the employers, I mean, your testimony was that you really are like a passive processor. That's correct. That, that these people are being directed to you. Correct. Well, what is the motivation of these fiduciary employers to direct people to you? Why would they want to do that? Because it encourages people to come into the plan. It encourages people to stay in the plan. And they're making money. I'm sorry? And they're going to make money. Who's going to make money? The employer gets part of the money, right? No, 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 no. They don't get anything? Oh, of course not. They don't get, I thought I heard no, your no, testimony no, no. that they no, get part of the fees. No, no, not at all. Not at all. That's the, that's the plan administrator. Okay. Well, so what you're saying is that the fiduciary duty that it, these plans have they see giving their participants a debit card to access the money is within their fiduciary responsibility, and that's why they're turning to your... What, what we're finding statistically is more people are willing to participate because they feel the access. The access, the money is available to them. In fact, what we're seeing is that there's less money being borrowed through our program than there is through a conventional program. In a conventional program, what you have to do is anticipate an entire need, and you take all that money out of the plan at one time. That's not the case with us. Okay. Well, I, I know you've testified that when they have a debit card, you, they contribute more into the plan and take less out of the plan. Correct. I would sure like the backup for that. That's Fine. hard. Can... That's hard for me to believe. And you're saying that they're accumulating greater overall retirement savings by having a debit card that they can go and buy a latte with it? I think that's gross exaggeration. If you look at the data that's provided by the other people that are on their panel, irresponsible loans amount to very little of the whole thing, of all the loans that are taken from plants. So I wouldn't extrapolate some gratuitous comment from some of the commentator up here on that. Um, 
It, 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 it's psychological. When we started the money funds, we went to the brokerage houses and we said to them, we want you to take uh, your clients' balances and give them to us, put them in a money market fund. And the reaction of the brokerage houses was, you're out of your mind, that's the essence of profit that comes to the brokerage house. As a result, we had a fight to get into the brokerage houses. Today, there is over $3 trillion that's invested in money market funds from brokerage houses because, in fact, the clients of the brokerage houses leave more money there because they feel the access. Okay, the second step we took in the money market funds is by opening checking accounts against the accounts. So then the brokerage houses said to us, you're, you're truly out of your mind because this way they're going to take the money out of here and it won't be within the brokerage houses. What happened is more money came into the plant. Finally, a debit card was attached to the access of money market funds within banks, excuse me, within brokerage houses, and indeed more money came in. So it's a psychological thing. It's not a question that people use it. It's a question that they know that they can get to it. Well, I, I just got to tell you, um, I am not aware that the, the, advent, the, the advantages of credit cards and debit cards have led to savings. I, um, every experience I've had in my life uh, is, is counterintuitive to that, and I would like the backup for these claims Be that, more than that, they are, that people are saving more because they can charge. Now, let me ask you a specific question, and if it is your testimony that the plans have no profit motive whatsoever to turn people to your program and that you're just a passive processor, I'm assuming you're out selling this concept to people. We try. Okay. Um, what is the, let's assume hypothetically that somebody takes out a $7,000 worth of their, which is the average amount of a loan that's being taken out right now. Let's assume someone owes you $7,000 on one of these debit cards and they lose their job. Uh -huh. um, what, what's the interest rate they're going to pay on that right now? They pay 7.9%, uh, 5% five, five of which goes back to them. 2.9% is paid to the reserve. The, the, total? Total. So you're only collecting 2.9% on this debt? That's correct. Well, you're never going to make money. Bless you. I hope that. <laughs> yeah, so you're not, it's not prime plus 2.9. It's prime plus 2.9. Okay, what's the total amount of interest they're paying right now? 7.9%. And I think what you're missing is the fact that it's their own money. So what I am doing is I am administering the loan. I am not lending money to them. But I'm talking about if they, if they, if they owe the money, if they've spent the money, what are they paying? They owe it to themselves. They, they're paying 7.9%. And how long will it go before they get a penalty from the IRS for using that money or have to pay extra taxes? Well, if they that? don't use Reserve Plus and they go to the I conventional... I understand. If they use Reserve Plus, I'm asking. They reserve, if they use Reserve Plus, they can stay there for five years and pay back their loan. But it, what happens at five years if they haven't paid it back? Same as it happens under a conventional loan. I understand. But, but instead of having a deadline of 90 days, they always have the five-year deadline, which they have with your money, with a debit card, or they have with a conventional loan. It's Correct. a five-year limit. Correct. Okay. And do you think they all understand that clearly? It's the same as it is with a conventional loan. It's nothing different. Well, I understand, but most credit cards, you don't have to pay them back in five years. Do you think that most people understand that on that amount, they're going to be, the, the toll is going to go significantly up in five years? Senator, I think you're confusing credit cards and this access to your savings. I think the consuming public is going to confuse credit cards and access to these savings because it feels and walks like a duck. I'm, 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 my apologies for not being able to convey this to you, but it's their money. It's not my money. I am not lending them money. Whether they go through the reserve plan or a traditional plan, if they f default on the loan, what happens is that then they will pay taxes on it. I am not changing the law. The law That is not within my power. I understand. I'm Thank strictly you. an administrator. Thank you, Mr. Bent. Thank you, Senator McCastle. Before we turn to Senator Schumer, one question for you, Mr. Long. You testified that you were concerned about recent ads urging TSP participants to roll their accounts over into higher IRA, higher fee IRAs. I agree with your concern, and I'm calling on these companies to stop running ads that portray TSP as, quote, irrelevant or outdated. Can you share with us why you think these ads are misleading and why most participants would want to stay 
in the TSB? The, uh, the ads that I uh, saw, one of which suggested that uh, you should leave when you're retired or when your TSP account retires, uh, or you, the other one was uh, referring to your old TSP account. TSP accounts are not old and TSP accounts don't retire. Uh, people who are leave federal service are welcome to leave their retirement funds with us and we actually encourage them to do so because the TSP has one very big advantage over virtually all private sector plans. That is a tremendously attractive fee structure. Uh, and so yes, I was not pleased when I saw ads that suggested the TSP was old or retired. Thank you very much. Senator Schumer. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your letting me uh, attend this hearing because this is an issue I've been involved with a long, for a long time. In the 104th Congress, whenever that was, what are we now, the 110th? So about 12 or 13 years ago. Anyway, I was in the House, so it was before 1998. I read about a bank doing this. Uh, I think it was, uh, which bank was it? In Ohio. Bank One. And I was really upset because I think that savings is so important and there's so much pressure on people in today's society to spend, spend, spend and not to save. And here we had set up in Congress this great device 401ks which encourages people to save and to allow you to just go with your credit card and take money out of your 401k uh, made a mistake. It was a big mistake given everything that's happened here and you can make the arguments as Mr. Bent ably does about the free market uh, and all of that, but you know, we're not in the 1890s anymore. <laughs> and uh, I think doing things to encourage people to save and for their future makes a great deal of sense. Anyway, we introduced, I introduced the legislation then, and much to my surprise, Capital One withdrew the product. So I figured this issue was over, and uh, um, when you called this hearing, I wasn't even aware uh, that. Uh, um, Mr. Bent's bank was doing this, I said, I'm coming and I'm going to introduce legislation with you, Mr. Chairman, to deal with this issue, and I appreciate that. I appreciate we're doing this because, to me, it makes a great deal of sense. And, Mr. Bent, I know you say it's their money. It is their money. Um, there are penalties. I know you're trying to avoid those for five years. But, gee whiz, um, people scrounge to get that money into the 401k, whether it's theirs or their employers. Um, it's hard, and we shouldn't make it easy. I mean, there are unusual circumstances. God forbid a terrible illness. No one would say, wait for your retirement if you need money for a terrible illness. On the other hand, if there's an impulse to buy a flat screen TV <laughs> and take your uh, 401k out, I think, I think there should be barriers. And there certainly aren't barriers with an ATM card. And so uh, I'm supporting this legislation, and I just, uh, I missed your testimony, Mr. Bent, but do you have another argument other than it's their money? What about savings? What about the idea that it's easy in this society to have short-term gratification patterns and hard to have long-term gratification patterns, and there's nothing wrong? We provide other incentives for people to save, either for their retirement or other things. It's not a flat tax code that says, consumption and savings get the same. I, for one, would like to see greater incentives for people to save. Uh, just give me your general view. Um, and I understand your right as a capitalist to go ahead and do this uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> in free market America. Uh, you understand our right to say this is bad policy and no offense Absolutely. to you, we ought to change it. But just give me your view a little bit about what I said, about the difficulty for people saving in today's society, that one of the great problems with America is we don't save enough, that we shouldn't have incentives for savings and not, not to simply consume. Some would argue that the present recession that we are in, in a way, is because we like to stuff our face. We export less than we import. We save less than we uh, borrow. We consume more than we produce. And it's one of the great problems in America, and in a small way, what you're doing here would exacerbate that. Tell me what you think. Um, I think you're wrong. Uh, we're in a situation, you asked. I don't mind. <laughs> we're in a situation where lots of people who are younger and lower income 
do not participate in the 401k. The idea of the opting out of an in, uh, enrollment, I think, is great. We put that in on our plan as soon as it was possible. Um, but that, that being said, you still have a situation where people want to have access to the money. My argument, yes, that they have money, that it is their money and they should have access to it, that's fine. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about encouraging people to come into the plan. That boy, because of the access we give them, it's psychological, they don't use it. As evidenced by the fact that our average loan is lower. It's 35% lower than a traditional loan. And the, the clincher on the thing So is you're saying your plan encourages savings. That's correct. It, it encourages participation and it encourages, how can you argue that? If they're taking less because, money out. Because you're making the argument that if your plan wasn't available, they, people would, would break, go into their 401ks in another way, and that's just not going to be the case. Practical logic tells you when you can just use it as a credit card, it's a lot different than if you have to go through a whole lengthy process to do it. Lots of people buy on impulse and regret buying what they bought on impulse the next uh, week. If you like to go to Fidelity right now and you want to take out a conventional loan, you go click, 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 the check is in the mail. Well, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't allow that either. That's not a good argument. I mean, to say other people do something that's no, not what good. what I'm saying is that you're turning around and you're trying to paint my product as something evil it is not. Well, it I'm encourages not saying it's evil. people. I'm saying well, it's, well, it discourages <laughs> savings, encourages consumption. Okay, we can debate it forever. Final thing is when someone goes into a retirement situation, not a retirement, when they lose their job, under the current situation, they have to pay their money back in 90 days. Yeah. That's not the case with us. Right. You can continue to make payments for five years. But it's every a major... With, every withdrawal is a new loan, each one with its own fees and everything else, right? So in other words, if you got one big loan of five thousand dollars or you went to your used your credit card and did ten ten different withdrawals of five hundred dollars each wouldn't you pay many more fees in your situation no not at all if we're going to go, go back to bank one in the bank one situation yes. where they had the 401k access the money came out in a lump sum it was immediately outside the plan and therefore any uh, savings that or every, any uh, interest that the people earned on that money before they actually consumed it was outside of the plan. So one, conventional plans incent people to take out monies in lump sum, mine does not. Conventional plans force people that any interest that they earn on the money they take out in anticipation of needs over the next 30, 60, 90 days or six months or a year, whatever it may be, would be taxed immediately. Mine it is not. So under but my there are new fees under yours each no, time. No, 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 I'm working up to it. Okay, so fine. What we do is we move from the, the conventional corpus of the fund, the in, your retirement fund, which is stocks, bonds, although that hasn't been a great place over the last eight years, uh, and you go into a money market account. The money market account is within the plan, okay? So now what happens is that you've said, okay, I have 50000 in the plan and I think I'm going to need $5,000 for whatever the reasons are. It moves from this part of the plan, the stock and bond, into this part of the plan, which is the money market. But it's still within the plan. You pay no fees. You pay a fee if you want to uh, sign up for the loan, but that goes to the TPA administrator. That doesn't matter whether it's a conventional loan or my loan. Okay, so you're now into the money market account, let's say. You go in and you exit $50 at a time or $500 at a time, there's no additional fees, nothing. You pay, you effectively, you pay What if you increase the money in that money market fund by $500 at a time? You say you take 5,000, you set aside 5,000 out of your 50,000. What if right. you only set aside 500 and then you set aside another 500 and you set aside another 500? No fees. No? Not from me, no. Not at all. Okay. Confused. I'm not sure that's okay. That's not my understanding. Well, your understanding is wrong. Okay. How about Mr. Avery? Do you have something to say here? Uh, yes, I think you're right, Senator. An uh, individual can take out more than one loan. Right. And the limits on the total amount of loans do look to how much you have outstanding uh, on a look back basis, but that doesn't mean that you can't take out uh, what another you need loan and with then take another fees. loan out. Is right. he wrong? So you can do oh, that. He's right. No. He's agreeing with me, not you. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. Who are you agreeing with, Mr. <laughs> Ebrey? I'm agreeing with you, Senator. Smart guy. 
<laughs> what did I say that was wrong? I'm sorry, I misunderstood what you said then. Explain. I think the senator, I think, is making the point that a, a person who does not have a credit card or a debit card access to loans can also take out uh, as, only as much as she might need, and if she needs more, can then take out another loan right. uh, for an additional amount. Right. But there's fees charged for each time you do it under the TPA's uh, fees structure right now. That's what his question was. I don't have those fees, so you're wrong. No, but you, no. okay, let me go on here. Let's, can I, Mr. Chairman, am I? Okay. Let's do a comparison here. Maybe this will bring some of this to light, although this is a slightly different issue. You contain a comparison because you talk about the average loan amount of a reserve loan compared to a regular loan, and you say the average amount is different, right? Correct. Okay. Lower. But to compare the products, we need to make in, in a different comparison. So let's take two people with the same income and a plan balance who each take out $8,000, okay? Now, the first person takes out $8,000, puts the money in a bank, and spends $2,000 each quarter for a year, and then repays the loan within five years, okay? The second person puts $8,000 in a Reserve Plus account and withdraws $2,000 each quarter for a year, and then repays the loan within five years, okay? So those are, that's the apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Fundamentally, these people are the same. Now, but because each withdrawal under your plan is considered a separate loan with a separate fee, plus the setup fees, isn't the second person worse off, or are they the same? No. No, they're better off with mine. Why? Because the interest, number one, there's not different setup fees for each one of them, because there's only one loan. Okay. Number two, in the conventional loan situation, you take the money out, and you put it in a bank, and you earn interest on it, and you earn interest on it, and you pay taxes on that immediately. Okay, so you are saying the f person in your reserve account just pays one fee? Correct. Avery? Senator, if I, if I may, the, the fees that would be charged on a normal plan loan right. uh, depend on the particulars of that of plan. And in many cases, there would be very little uh, fee charged by the plan. There are lots of large 401k plans yes. in which there's there's only a nominal fee that's charged. Is your fee nominal? My fee is non-existent. It depends on what the TPA charges. No, but you did say you charge a fee. No, I the fee is for the amount that's utilized. So yes. there's no fee for opening for opening up a, a loan account. Opening up that money market account. Correct. That's what you said. Correct. Okay. But there is a fee each time you borrow against that no. money market account. No. no fee at all. No. So no. this is fee-free? It's fee-free relative what, okay. to what you're saying. And in addition... Wait, is it fee-free, period? What fees, what fees do people pay? When they, oh, they pay the TPA, the, the uh, plan administrator, they pay him, I think we said, average $75. Perfect. That doesn't go to me. It goes to the plan administrator. If the plan administrator sets up... And you get no fee at all. Your company gets no fee for fees. any of this? No, 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 no. Aside from your annual. I'm talking about fees each time they take out a loan. No, no. there is not. Plus, plus what he... Right, I think we have a... What he ignored Senator, was the wait, fact that... Mr. Every, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead, Mr. The Senator, interest there's a that statement. Earned, ex, am ex, I speaking or is he speaking? Let him, Mr. Bent and then Mr. Okay. Every. Okay. The interest that is earned when the money comes out of... The conventional loan is taxed immediately. With mine, it is not. Under the scenario that you outlined, the person is better off under my plan than they are on the conventional plan. Go ahead, Mr. Avery. Uh, Mr. Bent's written statement says that the plan participants pay a service fee to Reserve Plus, right. which ranges from 2.9% to 3.25%. Now, what is that? That's on loan balances actually utilized. Uh, right, exactly. But that's what that's we're saying. That's not a transaction fee. Okay, but they pay a fee. It's of course. Okay. <laughs> of course. There's a difference. There's a substantial difference. Senator Schumer, you've done great. Thank you, Mr. Pammon. <laughs> Thank you. You want to make a comment? Well, I wanted to ask a question. I'm confused. Um, and if anyone is not confused at this point, they haven't been listening. Um, <laughs> um, Raise your hands. What I don't understand is how you have the ability to call this fund still as part of the fund. What you're saying is legally they are setting aside part of their money and putting it in one of your money markets. Which they can do in a conventional fund I, I today. I get that. I get that. But you're saying the difference is, it's, and it's still part of the fund. Correct. 
and that not, there's no penalties that inure to them, none of that. Absolutely. Then why is it that you get five years if they quit and the loans only get 90 days? Why, why do you, you're saying that if they leave their job, they don't have to repay it That's in right. 90 days. You're saying that if, if they leave their job, they, they don't have any penalty, they have up to five years to pay themselves back without having to endure the penalties. Well, if it's still part of the fund, if, if you're still considering this part of their fund, what is the legal, maybe it's not an artifice, it feels like an artifice, what is the legal artifice that allows you to remain part of that fund for purposes of five-year payback and not have the 90 days? Take the 401k fund, divide it into two parts. In the fund, all right, you have conventional investment fund, and you have the part that the, the beneficiary has decided that they want to have that as an access loan fund for them. It is within the plan. If they leave their employer tomorrow and they haven't used anything in that loan fund, no, no, no harm, no foul, zero. They don't owe anything to themselves. They don't owe anything to me. There's no fee. There's nothing. It's all within the plan. But what if they do owe, what if they do owe that? You have testified that the benefit of your plan over a conventional loan is the reason everyone's dying to get these debit cards because they're going to be that they're saving more money is because they do not have to worry about the 90-day payback. What legal basis are you using to say you don't have to pay it back in 90 days? You have Fund A and Fund B within the retirement plan. One is conventional stocks bonds. The other one is you have designated as a loan fund. It's all within the plan. You have not used any of it. Now you use some of it. Arbitrarily, you use $5,000, okay? Right. You now have the $5,000 out. It's a loan. You've used it for whatever you use it for. Right. Medical expenses, so on and so forth. Right. You then lose your job. Right. Under conventional loan policy, tradition, if you will, you have 90 days to pay it back to your employer. The employer could choose to have it paid back over five years, but they don't. Traditionally, they don't because they want to get it off their books. Under my program, what I will do is I will accept payments from those people to pay back their loan to themselves, and they don't have this cataclysmic event of okay. losing their job and having to pay it. I understand. So this is the choice, a business choice of your company to not, there's no legal requirement they pay it back to their employer. Their employer just wants it back that quickly, and you don't care if they take longer. Paraphrasing, yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you, Senator McCaskill, Senator Schumer, and all the members of the committee. I, I believe we have again brought to the surface the importance of retirement programs, the importance of the 401k, the need to shore it up, and to be certain that it's used for the right purposes, how important it is to our country. Um, and we will be following up with you and with legislation uh, towards that end. And you've been very good today. Your testimony has really advanced, I believe, the cause. And we appreciate your being here. We appreciate all of you for being here today. And this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Early for retirement. Uh, um, well, I, I think when it comes to the current economic situation, it's important to understand that the downturn in the housing market and the stock market has been a bad situation worse. It wasn't like we had this wonderful econo economy before 2007 and everything was going well. On the contrary, the labor market was weak. People had to borrow a lot of money. That made them very vulnerable to the current economic downturn. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing at this point. People already had very few savings. They were highly leveraged, so they're losing their homes. The home equity is dropping. At this point, people own the smallest share of the homes that we have on record, 46% of their home is actually their own. Um, so I, I think the, the parade of horribles at this point means we're going to see more foreclosures. We're going to see more bankruptcies. We have seen an 80% uh, increase in the bankruptcy rate, 90% in bankruptcy filing since 2006. 
So that kind of part, that's the first line of defense. We're going to see ma massive de foreclosures and defaults, and that's going to continue. The second part is we're going to see people struggling with higher costs of living, and that ultimately means less retirement savings. And on top of that, because in a we, we are in a weak economy, employers are cutting back on the benefits that people have traditionally relied on to make ends meet, such as in retirement savings and health insurance. So ultimately what that adds up to is that we see a big drop down in financial security and ultimately in retirement income security. I, again, it, it's a little too early at this point to come up with a complete numbers, but we already saw a big... We probably have more leakage coming from lump sums paid out, <coughs> excuse me, paid out between jobs than we do from the more restrictive loan and hardship withdrawal regimes that apply while the person is employed. So that's the area that I think we need to question as the highest priority. Do we really want to be offering the money to a participant every time he or she changes from one 401k sponsor to another rather than having a portable, seamless saving system? Well, I mean, clearly we, you know, plan uh, loans and hardship with withdrawals are designed to provide liquidity as an inducement for people to enroll in the first place. I think you've all made that clear. But if you go to an automatic enrollment system, do we need those kinds of inducements? Uh, where do we draw this line? That's really what I'm getting at. I, I, I think it's a great question. It's a balancing. The employer is trying to induce participation by offering enough liquidity so people feel they can get that money if they really desperately need it. But we should leave that door open only a crack uh, and a an automatic enrollment plan gets that kind of participation probably with less need for liquidity as an inducement. Therefore, the employer should feel freer, and we would hope that policymakers would feel click, click, the check is in the mail. Well, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't allow that either. That's not a good argument. I mean, to say other people do something that's no, not what good. I'm saying is that you're turning around and you're trying to paint my product as something evil it is not. Well, it I'm encourages not saying it's evil. people. I'm saying well, it's, well, it <laughs> discourages savings, encourages consumption. Okay, we can debate it forever. Final thing is when someone goes into a retirement situation, well, not a retirement, when they lose their job, under the current situation, they have to pay their money back in 90 days. That's not the case with us. Right. You can continue to make payments for five years. But it's every a major... With, every withdrawal is a new loan, each one with its own fees and everything else, right? So in other words, if you got one big loan of $5,000 or you went to your, used your credit card and did 10, 10 different withdrawals of $500 each, wouldn't you pay many more fees in your situation? No, not at all. If we go, and go, go back to Bank One, in the Bank One situation yes. where they had the 401k access, the money came out in a lump sum. It was immediately outside the plan. And therefore, any uh, savings that they, or every, any uh, interest that the people earned on that money before they actually consumed it was outside of the plan. So one, conventional plans incent people to take out monies in lump sum. Mine does not. Conventional plans force people that any interest that they earn on the money they take out in anticipation of needs over the next 30, 60, 90. They are setting aside part of their money and putting it in one of your money markets. Which they can do in a conventional fund I, I get today. that. I get that. But you're saying the difference is, it, and it's still part of the fund. Correct. And that not, there's no penalties that inure to them, none of that. Absolutely. Then why is it that you get five years if they quit and the loans only get 90 days? Why, why do you, you're saying that if they leave their job, they don't have to repay it That's in right. 90 days. You're saying that if, if they leave their job, they, they don't have any penalty. They have up to five years to pay themselves back without having to endure the penalties. Well, if it's still part of the fund, if, if you're still considering this part of their fund, what is the legal, maybe it's not an artifice, it feels like an artifice, what is the legal artifice that allows you to remain part of that fund for purposes of five-year payback and not have the 90 days? Take the 401k fund, divide it into two parts. In the fund, all right, you have conventional investment fund, and you have the part that the, the beneficiary has decided that they want to have that as an access loan fund for them. It is within the plan. 
If they leave their employer tomorrow and they haven't used anything in that loan fund, no, you know, no harm, no foul, zero. They don't owe anything to themselves. They don't owe anything to me outside the plan. And therefore, any uh, savings that they, or every, any uh, interest that the people earned on that money before they actually consumed it was outside of the plan. So one, conventional plans incent people to take out monies in lump sum. Mine does not. Conventional plans force people that any interest that they earn on the money they take out in anticipation of needs over the next 30, 60, 90 days or six months or a year, whatever it may be, would be taxed immediately. Mine it is not. So under but my there are new fees under yours each no, time. No, 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 I'm working up to it. Okay, so fine. What we do is we move from the, the conventional corpus of the fund, the in, your retirement fund, which is stocks, bonds, although that hasn't been a great place over the last eight years, uh, and you go into a money market account. The money market account is within the plan, okay? So now what happens is that you've said, okay, I have 50000 in the plan and I think I'm going to need $5,000 for whatever the reasons are. It moves from this part of the plan, the stock and bond, into this part of the plan, which is the money market. But it's still within the plan. You pay no fees. You pay a fee if you want to uh, sign up for the loan, but that goes to the TPA administrator. That doesn't matter whether it's a conventional loan or my loan. Okay, so you're now into the money market account, let's say. You go in and you ask at $50 at a time or $500 a time, there's no additional fees, nothing. You pay, you effectively, you pay what tomorrow if? through our program than there is through a conventional program. In a conventional program, what you have to do is anticipate an entire need and you take all that money out of the plan at one time. That's not the case with us. Okay. Well, I, I know you've testified that when they have a debit card, you, they contribute more into the plan and take less out of the plan. Correct. I would sure like the backup for that. That's Fine. hard. Can... That's hard for me to believe. And you're saying that they're accumulating greater overall retirement savings by having a debit card that they can go and buy a latte with it? I think that's a gross exaggeration. If you look at the data that's provided by the other people that are on their panel, Irresponsible loans amount to very little of the whole thing, of all the loans that are taken from plants. So I wouldn't extrapolate some gratuitous comment from some of the commentator up here on that. Um, it, it, it's psychological. When we started the money funds, we went to the brokerage houses and we said to them, we want you to take uh, your clients' balances and give them to us, put them in a money market fund. And the reaction of the brokerage houses was, you're out of your mind, that's the essence of profit that comes to the brokerage house. As a result, we had a fight to get into the brokerage houses. Today, there is over $3 trillion that's invested in money market funds from brokerage houses because, in fact, the clients of the brokerage houses leave more money there. $100 each. Wouldn't you pay many more fees in your situation? No, not at all. If we go, and go, go back to Bank One, in the Bank One situation yes. where they had the 401k access, the money came out in a lump sum. It was immediately outside the plan. And therefore, any uh, savings that they, or every, any uh, interest that the people earned on that money before they actually consumed it was outside of the plan. So one, conventional plans incent people to take out monies in lump sum. Mine does not. Conventional plans force people that any interest that they earn on the money they take out in anticipation of needs over the next 30, 60, 90 days or six months or a year, whatever it may be, would be taxed immediately. Mine, it is not. So under but my... But there are new fees under yours each no, time. No, 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 I'm working up to it. Okay, so fine. What we do is we move from the, the conventional corpus of the fund, the in, your retirement fund, which is stocks, bonds, although that's, that hasn't been a great place over the last eight years, uh, and you go into a money market account. The money market account is within the plan, okay? So now what happens is that you've said, okay, I have 50000 in the plan and I think I'm going to need $5,000 for whatever the reasons are. It moves from this part of the plan, the stock and bond, into this part of the plan, which is the money market. But it's still within the plan. You pay no fees. You pay a fee if you want to uh, sign up for the loan, but that goes to the TPA administrator. That doesn't matter whether it's a conventional... ...lining the dangers of 401k debit cards. And we hope investors heed our warnings. Investors can use a debit card to borrow directly from their 401k account for any purpose. But as they spend it, they may wipe out a good portion of their retirement savings. Taking money out of your retirement savings 
even for a short period of time, can be disastrous. FINRA has developed a number of tools that focus on building and protecting retirement savings. First, we have our 401k Learning Center on our website, FINRA.org. Here we explain everything from 401k enrollment to the risks of cashing out before retirement. FINRA has also teamed up with the Retirement Securities Project and ARP to establish Retirement Made Simpler, an effort to use automatic features such as automatic enrollment to increase participation in 401k plans. We issue investor alerts warning about early retirement pitches and products that could be harmful, and we offer online tools to help employers check out early retirement salespeople and avoid potential scams. Mr. Chairman, FINRA appreciates the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with the committee, the SEC, and other regulators to expand Americans' financial knowledge and to help them build a secure retirement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gannon. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Mr. Ben. Chairman Cole, ranking members. Sorry. Chairman Cole, rank. I'm asking. They reserve if they use Reserve Plus, they can stay there for five years and pay back their loan. But it, what happens at five years if they haven't paid it back? Same as it happens under a conventional loan. I understand. But, but instead of having a deadline of 90 days, they always have the five-year deadline, which they have with your money, with a debit card, or they have with a conventional loan. It's Correct. a five-year limit. Correct. Okay. And do you think they all understand that clearly? It's the same as it is with a conventional loan. There's nothing different. Well, I understand, but most credit cards, you don't have to pay them back in five years. Do you think that most people understand that on that amount, they're going to be, the, the toll is going to go significantly up in five years? Senator, I think you're confusing credit cards and this access to your savings. I think the consuming public is going to confuse credit cards and access to these savings because it feels and walks like a duck. I'm, 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 my apologies for not being able to convey this to you, but it's their money. It's not my money. I am not lending them money. Whether they go through the reserve plan or a traditional plan, if they f default on the loan, what happens is that then they will pay taxes on it. I am not changing the law. The law. That is not within my power. I understand. I'm Thank strictly you. an administrator. Thank you, Mr. Bent. Thank you, Senator McCaskill. Before we turn to Senator Schumer, one question for you, Mr. Long. You testified that you were concerned about recent ads urging TSP participants to roll their account. Documentation. As with loans, the board found this requirement to be administratively burdensome. Therefore, with the introduction of the new record-keeping system, participants were permitted to self-certify their hardship conditions. However, I would like to point out that in addition to the tax consequences, participants are also restricted from making employee contributions and therefore from receiving matching contributions for six months after uh, taking a financial hardship withdrawal. Therefore, there are deterrents built into the program. Uh, finally, I, I, uh, I've also provided the committee with copies of our 2008 edition of Highlights, which is our newsletter. The feature article of this newsletter, which is published on our website, is being sent to participants. The key article is called Look Before You Leap. I would like to explain why I found it necessary to issue such a caution to participants. Earlier this year, I stepped out of the board's office in downtown Washington, and I saw a bus stop billboard that urged federal employees to transfer their old TSP account, uh, accounts, I put that in quotes, uh, to the advertising sponsor's IRA. Shortly thereafter, a second advertising campaign, which was similarly targeted, told readers that their TSP accounts would retire. I'm here today to advise that after 21 years, the TSP is still young and vigorous, it isn't getting old, and it does not intend to retire. Thanks to the wisdom of Senator Stevens and other congressional authors, it will continue to follow the timeless principle of tracking broad market performance while adding value for participants. End, last, end of last year, 18 percent of workers had loans outstanding from their plans, up to from 11 percent in 2006. Although I understand the reason, this trend concerns me and us, as tapping into 401k savings today can have a significant impact on one's level of income at retirement age. According to Vanguard, an employee who takes out two loans totaling $30,000 from their 401k and pays them back in five years will have almost $40,000 less in their 401k after 40 years than an employee who takes no loans. Considering the medium 
401k account balance in 2006 was about $66,000. $40,000 is a lot of money. This leads me to uh, my final point, one I've made many times before. Americans need to save more for retirement. For most of us, our 401ks will be our primary source of retirement savings. And, and $66,000 is certainly not enough money to retire on, especially if you take out another $40,000. I've been working over the past few years on ways to help Americans increase their retirement savings. I'm pleased that Mark uh, Avery and Dave John, uh, David John uh, from the Retirement Security Project are with us. And you take all that money out of the plan at one time. That's not the case with us. Okay. Well, I, I know you've testified that when they have a debit card, you, they contribute more into the plan and take less out of the plan. Correct. I would sure like the backup for that. That's Fine. hard. That's hard for me to believe. And you're saying that they're accumulating greater overall retirement savings by having a debit card that they can go and buy a latte with it? I think that's a gross exaggeration. If you look at the data that's provided by the other people that are on their panel, irresponsible loans amount to very little of the whole thing, of all the loans that are taken from plans. So I wouldn't extrapolate some gratuitous comment from some of the commentator up here on that. Um, it, it, it's psychological. When we started the money funds, we went to the brokerage houses and we said to them, we want you to take uh, your clients' balances and give them to us, put them in a money market fund. And the reaction of the brokerage houses was, you're out of your mind, that's the essence of profit that comes to the brokerage house. As a result, we had a fight to get into the brokerage houses. Today, there is over $3 trillion that's invested in money market funds from brokerage houses because, in fact, the clients of the brokerage houses leave more money there because they feel the access. Okay. The second step we took in the money market funds is by opening checking accounts against the accounts. So then the are no longer able to continue repaying their loans via payroll uh, deductions. In these circumstances, plans utilizing traditional loan processing typically give a participant only 90 days or less to repay all outstanding loans. A participant who is unable to repay the outstanding balance will incur a taxable distribution subject to regular city, state, and federal income taxes, an additional 10 percent penalty if they are under the age of 59 and a half. Obviously, the participant's retirement savings will also be reduced by the amount of the default. This instant repayment requirement in traditional plans is a significant deterrent to employees joining a plan because it becomes at a time that the participants are least able to afford it. This is not so with Reserve Plus. Under traditional loan plans, Reserve Plus is unlike traditional loan pl programs. Reserve Plus is not dependent on payroll deduction and allows participants to continue making their regular payments even after they leave their employer. Giving the increasingly mobile workforce, this feature of Reserve Plus helps safeguard participants' retirement savings. Reserve Plus also allows participants to prepay in advance in whole or in part at any time and to reduce the amount available in their loan account at any time, unlike traditional loan processing through payroll. We design Reserve Plus with several concrete advantages to plan participants over traditional loans. I share your concerns for American when homeowners, also home ownership, especially during the housing boom, has forced people to borrow more from their 401k loans. However, that comes at a cost. We find that homeowners who have a 401k loans typically have higher mortgage payments, less equity, and are more likely to have an adjusted mortgage. That means basically homeowners who are financially tapped out otherwise are now borrowing from a 401k loans to basically just afford the, 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 uh, the down payment in the housing boom period. So the solution here for us, at least, is that, that we need to find ways to keep people from borrowing, from tapping into retirement income security. That means we need to strengthen income growth, but we also need to create a stronger social safety net so that people do not have to use their 401k plans as supplemental unemployment insurance or health insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Weller. Mr. Avery, Mr. John. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Smith. I'm Mark Avery with the Brookings Institution. This is my colleague David John with the Heritage Foundation. We're both principals uh, of the Nonpartisan Retirement Security Project, and we're pleased to appear together essentially as a single witness before you today to emphasize the importance in this area in particular 
of an approach that transcends traditional partisan and ideological divisions. We would like to present our views jointly on savings, including the automatic IRA proposal that uh, you, Senator Smith, and uh, Senator Bingaman have. Last. I don't mind. <laughs> We're in a situation where lots of people who are younger and lower income do not participate in the 401k. The idea of the opting out of an en uh, enrollment, I think, is great. We put that in, in our plan as soon as it was possible. Um, but that, that being said, you still have a situation where people want to have access to the money. My argument, yes, that they have money, that it is their money and they should have access to it, that's fine. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about encouraging people to come into the plan. That boy, because of the access we give them, it's psychological. They don't use it, as evidenced by the fact that our average loan is lower. It's 35 percent lower than a traditional loan. And the, the clincher on the thing so is... So you're saying your plan encourages savings? That's correct. It, it encourages participation and it encourages... How can you argue that? If they're taking less because, money out... Because you're making the argument that if your plan wasn't available, they, people would, would break, go into their 401ks in another way, and that's just not going to be the case. Practical logic tells you when you can just use it as a credit card, it's a lot different than if you have to go through a whole lengthy process to do it. Lots of people buy on impulse and regret buying what they bought on impulse the next uh, week. If you like to go to Fidelity right now and you want to take out a conventional loan, you go click, click, lose your job. Right. Under conventional loan policy, tradition, if you will, you have 90 days to pay it back to your employer. The employer could choose to have it paid back over five years, but they don't. Traditionally, they don't because they want to get it off their books. Under my program, what I will do is I will accept payments from those people to pay back their loan to themselves, and they don't have this cataclysmic event of okay. losing their job and having to pay it. I understand. So this is the choice, a business choice of your company to not, there's no legal requirement they pay it back to their employer. Their employer just wants it back that quickly, and you don't care if they take longer. Paraphrasing, yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you, Senator McCaskill, Senator Schumer, and all the members of the committee. I, I believe we have, again, brought to the surface the importance of retirement programs, the importance of the 401K, the need to shore it up, and to be certain that it's used for the right purposes, how important it is to our country. Um, and we will be following up with you and with legislation uh, towards that end. And you've been very good today. Your testimony has really advanced, I believe, the cause. And we appreciate your being here. We appreciate all of you for being here today. And this hearing is adjourned. Avery. Senator, if I, if I may, the, the fees that would be charged on a normal plan loan right. uh, depend on the particulars of that of plan. And in many cases, there would be very little uh, fee charged by the plan. There are lots of large 401k plans yes. in which there's, there's only a nominal fee that's charged. Is your fee nominal? My fee is non-existent. It depends on what the TPA charges. No, but you did say you charge a fee. No, I, the fee is for the amount that's utilized. So yes. there's no fee for opening, for opening up a, a loan account. Opening up that money market account. Correct. That's what you said. Correct. Okay. But there is a fee each time you borrow against that no. money market account. No. no fee at all. No. So no. this is fee free? It's fee free relative what, okay. to what you're saying. And in addition Wait, is it fee free period? What fees what fees do people pay? When they oh, they pay the TPA, the tra the uh, plan administrator, they pay him, I think we said average seventy five dollars. That doesn't go to me, it goes to the plan administrator. If the plan administrator sets up... And you get no fee at all. Your company gets no fee for fees. any of this? We have annual no, fees. no, 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 no. Aside from your annual. I'm talking about fees each time they take out a loan. No, Nothing. there is not. Plus, plus what he... Right, I think we have a... What he ignored Senator, was the wait, fact that Mr. Avery... Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead, Mr. The Senator, interest there's a that statement. Earned, am I speaking or is he... Let him Mr. Bent and then Mr. Okay. Re ...transfer their money into a loan account within their plan. The amount in that account is then invested in the reserve money market mutual fund. Participants may then access the amount of their account using checks or a debit card. 
Each Reserve Plus participant is provided with materials cont containing a description of the service, its operation, and associated charges. The Committee has been provided with copies of these disclosures. The account opening fee averages $75 and the subsequent annual maintenance fee ranges from $25 to $50. Charges that typically apply to both conventional loan programs and Reserve Plus and are paid to the plan administrators, not reserved. As is usual with plastic-based transactions, there is a $2 fee for cash advances, but no fee for purchase by check or card. In addition, the plan participants pay themselves an interest rate of the prime rate and a service fee to Reserve Plus, which ranges from 2.9 to 3.25 percent on loan balances actually utilized. The average loan balance for participants in plans utilizing Reserve Plus is approximately 35 percent less than the average loan balance for all participant plans, specifically 48,000 versus 4,800, excuse me, versus 7,200. Our default rate is 2.2 percent, and we have been unable to determine what the industry average default rate is. Reserve Plus is different from traditional loan programs because it allows you to remain part of that fund for purposes of five-year payback and not have the 90 days. Take the 401k fund, divide it into two parts. In the fund, all right, you have conventional investment fund and you have the part that the, the beneficiary has decided that they want to have that as an access loan fund for them. It is within the plan. If they leave their employer tomorrow and they haven't used anything in that loan fund, no, you know, no harm, no foul, zero. They don't owe anything to themselves. They don't owe anything to me. There's no fee. There's nothing. It's all within the plan. But what if they do owe, what if they do owe that? You have testified that the benefit of your plan over a conventional loan is the reason everyone's dying to get these debit cards because they're going to be, th th they're saving more money is because they do not have to worry about the 90-day payback. What legal basis are you using to say you don't have to pay it back in 90 days? You have Fund A and Fund B within the retirement plan. One is conventional stocks bonds, the other one is you have designated as a loan fund. It's all within the plan. You have not used any of it. Now you use some of it. Arbitrarily you use $5,000, okay? Right. You now have the $5,000 out, it's a loan. You've used it for whatever you use it for, right. medical expenses, so on and so forth. 60-day waiting period between loans and a limit of just one general purpose and one primary residential loan at any time. We view these changes, which we continue to employ today, as highly effective. A total of 353,000 new TSP loans were dispersed during 2003. Uh, in 2005, that number dropped to 192,000. The overall number of loans, which was rapidly approaching one million, has uh, steadily declined. Meanwhile, the total average monthly contribution per participant has continued to steadily increase, from $432 per month in 2005 to $497 uh, per month in 2008. Unlike the changes that characterize the 20-year history of the TSP loan program, the in-service withdrawal program, which first became available in 1997, has had only one major change. Originally, like loans, hardship requ uh, required documentation. As with loans, the board found this requirement to be administratively burdensome. Therefore, with the introduction of the new record-keeping system, participants were permitted to self-certify their hardship conditions. However, I would like to point out that in addition to the tax consequences, participants are also restricted from making employee contributions and therefore from receiving matching contributions for six months after uh, taking a financial hardship withdrawal. Therefore, there are deterrents built into the program. Uh, finally, I, I, uh, I've also provided the committee with a postal employee and a school cafeteria worker. <clears throat> I am very proud of the innovations Reserve Plus offers to participants in overcoming many shortcomings of the prevailing practices that encourage workers, regardless of income level, to participate in retire plans at the maximum level as soon as they are eligible. Thank you for your time. Again, happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bent. Turn now to my colleague, the ranking member, Senator Smith, for his uh, questions, and then we'll turn to Senator Salazar and Senator McCaskill. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, all of you, your testimony has been excellent. Um, 
I wonder, uh, Mark and, and David, as you've gone out with your, I think, very bipartisan proposal on automatic RAs, uh, I think you both commented that the more people know, the more uh, they warm up to it. Uh, I assume that is, I heard you correctly. You did, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously we're here because we have a real dilemma. We, we have a national savings problem. We have a demographic bubble with the baby boom generation getting ready to retire and insufficient preparation for retirement. And we're looking for what we can best do to facilitate um, the retirement of, of uh, elder Americans. I'm wondering, in, in your opinion, any of you... TSP was of necessity conducted over long distances by mail was administratively difficult. Finally, some participants with financial difficulties were already overwhelmed by debt. They required debt relief in order to get their heads above water. The board worked with the Congress and Senator Ted Stevens in particular, who was widely regarded as the father of the TSP, to resolve these issues in legislation. As a result, the Thrift Savings Plan Act of 1996, the board was permitted to offer general purpose loans requiring no documentation. Additionally, in-service withdrawals for financial hardship and for those who attained age 59 and a half were allowed for the first time. As expected, loan activity increased. Between 1997 and 2003, the number of participants with loans increased from 219,000 to 554,000. Although we cannot demonstrate any direct connection, the FERS participation rate increased from 82.9 to 86.9 percent during the same period. The TSP loan program was again modified in 2004. The need for this change was identified a year earlier when the board implemented a new daily value record keeping system. A relatively small number of participants were found to be uh, borrowing slightly larger amounts over and over again in an apparent attempt to supplement their basic pay. A review of this practice found that one participant had used the program to borrow 31 times. As the board was implementing a new with fuel and four dollar a gallon gas. We know the hardship that people are facing with respect to home ownership giving, given the housing crisis that we're seeing across America. We know what's happening with the huge escalating costs in higher education and we know uh, what's happening with health care healthcare costs for, for Americans. People may disagree whether we're in a recession or not but I don't, I don't think there's any disagreement that there's, there are a lot of Americans who are facing tremendous hardship and so when you have that kind of hardship and you're feeling that kind of economic pain, you start looking to those uh, potential assets that you have to help you through these hard times. And so whether it's taking loans from your 401k or maybe uh, taking an early withdrawal from your 401k, uh, what is the parade of horribles here? I mean, if, if, if the economic times continue to be as uh, painful as they um, uh, are, I think, in the last several months, if uh, they continue to exacerbate, uh, what's going to happen to the savings smartly for retirement? Uh, um, well, I, I think when it comes to the current economic situation, it's important to understand that the downturn in the housing market and the stock market has been a bad situation worse. It wasn't like we had this wonderful econo economy before 2007 and everything was going well. On the contrary, the labor market was weak. People had to borrow a lot of money that made them very vulnerable to the current economic downturn. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing at this point. People 